The way to gain a good reputation is to endeavor to be what you desire to appear. Socrates. Welcome to Talk Therapy, CBT, a conversation about psychology focused on educating, helping, and connecting people. Talk Therapy CBT is brought to you by Inner Balance Psychology Center. I am Anthony Dana, your host, and here with me is Dr. Dawn Raffa. Good evening, Dr. Raffa. Good evening, Anthony. And so here we are, our debut show, and we are here to talk about therapy to a PhD. What I envision this show to be is I am going to do the best I can, at least on the first show, to you know be that curious mind that is interested in psychology and doesn't know a whole lot about it, but wants to learn. And like I said, is very curious. So as the show continues, you know what I hope it becomes is a way for everybody out there to send in questions, to you know bring up ideas bring up issues within psychology and within, you know, the mental health spectrum that you need some intel on. And that's why we're here. So today's show is about the reputation of psychology. But first, on that note of just asking the questions that hopefully most of you would want to know or might be curious about, I'm going to start off with a question that I've always thought about and just kind of mostly from watching television or just, you know, talking to people about, you know, oh, I have to go see my shrink or, you know, a TV show might, you know, have a, um, a special witness who is a psychologist who can maybe help prove something one way or the other, psychologist, psychiatrist. And there's the age old question. Too many times, and I know there is a difference, I just don't know exactly what, and that's why that's why we're here, and that's why we're talking to Dr. Rafa. What is the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist? And then we'll get to know a little bit about your background so uh, the audience can just, you know, know your credentials and know you're just not somebody I just, uh, you know, who's an actress and looking to try to pass off a psychologist. So first of all, so psychiatrist, psychologist. First of all, does this irk you? in any way, or a little bit? Work me as far as uh, when people ask me what the difference is. Um, sometimes, yeah, it definitely does. So like you said, in um, movies and TV shows, the two are typically used interchangeably. So the major difference is a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. So they went to medical school, and they per uh, prescribe medication and typically uh, do not do any type of therapy, nor do they have the training to do that in present day uh, psychiatry programs. And psychologist is someone who has a doctorate degree, so a PhD, um, an EDD, a PsyD in psychology, in clinical psychology. So um, we can do testing, we can do psychological testing, one of the major differences. So um, we're both, you know, called doctors. So a lot of people mistake the two. So, all right, now, I know I can probably just Google this later, but you're right here. EDD. Yeah. What does that mean? It is a doctorate in education. Okay. And do you quickly correct people if they call you a psychiatrist? Yes. Okay. Very much. And it's, it's why is that? <laughs> why do I correct people when they say, um, are you well, a psychiatrist? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, you would want to correct anybody who, you know, if somebody calls me a professor, it's like, no, no, no I'm just a teacher. So, you know, but in your case, you... It depends on the audience. Okay. Yeah, on how forthcoming and forthright I am about it. But okay. um, I often, usually it's more so for the medication because people often think I can prescribe medication and I can't, nor do I want to. Right. So both are good, but psychologists can do a lot more good, <laughs> you feel, <laughs> um, or, or are capable of, of doing uh, a lot more for vast majority as opposed to psychiatrists. And that's mostly what within recent years, because it wasn't always like that. So um, historically, psychiatrists would do a version of therapy and spend like an hour, you know, with their patients. But because of insurance limitations, they usually only have an hour for the evaluation and then 15 minute med 
management, oftentimes they don't even know who their patients are. Mm -hmm. I've had my patients complain about that. Where, um, you know, psychologists, we spend an hour each week, we really get to know people. And I think our job is, is more difficult to some degree because we have to help people change their thinking and change their behaviors. We do collaborate and work with psychiatrists. So I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. They can complement each other. Okay. And you only have an hour a week to get that done. Do you have people who maybe go like twice a week or does that happen very often or... It can happen depending on money and insurance limitations. Sometimes people will come twice a week if it's clinically indicated to do so. But usually with medication, people go in for an evaluation and they go back maybe every month and then to every three months or so. So when we work with people, we definitely see them more often and get a lot more uh, you know, information about their history. And your patients have homework, I would imagine. So you give out homework too. Yes, an essence of the kind of therapy that I do is doing homework. All right. So let's get to know a little bit about Dr. Rafa and your credentials and a, li a little bit about your background. So, um, you know, wherever you like to begin, where you, um, you know, where you're from, where you went to school and all that. Sure. So I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I went to Rutgers in New Brunswick to get my bachelor's in psychology and philosophy. I got my master's degree in social work as well from Rutgers, and then I got my PhD from Walden University in clinical psychology. I have three practice locations in, I have two, I have two practice locations in New Jersey, one in Philadelphia. It's Interbound Psychology Center, and we see children and we see adults. We provide testing, we provide therapy, and we're going to be expanding our services as well to that of autism services for ABA and also for uh, potentially medication management as well. Cool. Uh, the two in New Jersey, where are they located? So Marlton, New Jersey and Pennington, New Jersey in Mercer County. Okay. And the Philadelphia office is Center City. Okay. And how long have you, um, have you had the, uh, the practice? Since 2014 for the group practice, I have about 13 therapists that work for me now. And my solo practice, I started in 2009. Okay. And I'm just, I'm just curious. Well, the flagship office it was Marlton? It was actually Pennington. Oh, Pennington. And then you went to Marlton. And then the last, right. uh, Philadelphia. So, okay. We went Pennington, Marlton, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Roger that. All right. The title of the show is Talk Therapy CBT. Why CBT? So I was initially going to go with just talk therapy, but there were a lot of those when I was looking at uh, possible names of the podcast. And CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and that is the type of therapy that I do and practice from. i um, passionate about it, and I trained in Cognitive Behavioral Therapy as well. Okay. So where did you train for your CBT therapy? Um, so I went to um, the Beck Institute. It's in Balakinwood, yeah, I'm outside of Philadelphia. Aaron Beck and his kids actually formed it. And that's where one goes to become a certified CBT therapist. They formed the school or who is the founder of the CBT therapy? Or is it just a group? Was it a group effort? So Aaron Beck created uh, cognitive behavioral therapy back in the 1960s, okay. and he, they have the Beck Institute. I don't remember when. Okay, they so they they, they it, created or they okay that's what I meant. Like, to training. Okay, okay, so yeah. okay, but he is the He's godfather the of of, yes. of of CBT therapy. <laughs> yes, okay, he originated it. Yes, and is this something that everybody who practices CBT therapy is this their training? Is this what they need to do? Because you know I know therapists who advertise. In fact, my daughter's therapist even told me that she practices CBT therapy. So is this something that everybody who practices CBT therapy needs to do, or is it just you're just more specialized in it? I think that, yes, it's great for people to get certified in it. And in order to call yourself a CBT therapist, you, you have to have a certification in it. Although, unfortunately, people will say listed in their ways in which they do therapy, they'll list it as a treatment modality. But in order to be certified, you have to have a ton of training, supervision, pass an exam to be considered certified. Okay. Okay. So how I see it is, so I'm a history teacher. I can teach history. I teach the Civil War. 
and I know the Civil War pretty well, but you wouldn't learn as much if, unless you had like a um, somebody who has their PhD in Civil War studies or Gettysburg to be more specific. So, okay, I get it. And what's um? Are there any perks to training at this institute other than being obviously you know? So um, I had the fortune of meeting Aaron Beck. He comes into the training and watching him do uh, therapy with potential patients, you know, while we're there. And I trained specifically for six months under supervision with his son. And also his daughter pretty much runs the Institute now. He is also part of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy, which I'm part of as well. Hmm. And they have annual birthday parties for him. Oh, wow. Well. So I have you ever that. been to one? I've never been to one. But, well, um, um, where where are they? Where does he? Uh, you know, I, um, I believe that they're in. Or Philadelphia. Where are the parties? Maybe he I, I, you know, I don't know if they change locations, but I'm pretty sure it's in Philly. Okay, but does so, he does he invite you to his house? Because that'd be cool. I don't think it's his house, but they usually have like a gala for him or something. Okay, know? I guess. So hopefully this year they'll have one for him because oh. he's going to be a hundred. Oh year. well, if you've ever okay, so if you've never gone, then I guess this would be the year to go. I would love to go. That sounds year. that sounds wow. A hundred years old. God bless him. So what's his son like? You trained under him. Really nice man. Very helpful. Really. Um, He's just been in, obviously, the business, family business for a really long time, <laughs> down to earth. Yeah. So it was really, really awesome to, to get that kind of training. When I opened my letter, I saw that he was my supervisor. I freaked out a little bit. Yeah. But That's it cool. ended up being completely cool. Cool. And he has um, how many daughters or just has one? Uh, wow, you're quizzing me today. And I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> Um, I Googled him once or twice. Uh, yeah. I kind of knew we were going to touch on I him. I think he has several children. I want to say, well, at least Judith is his daughter, but I'm um, not sure. I okay. Think, Sorry, no more curveballs. <laughs> I, I have to Google that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so today's show is about the reputation of therapy. Right. All right. So I guess the best way to get this topic started is to ask you, has the reputation of therapy, is it, is it in a good place right now? And how has it changed? Mm -hmm. What was it like? I guess, what was it like in its infancy? That's a better way to look at it. So what was it like in its infancy? Sure. And then how has it transcended, evolved into what it is today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the history of psychology, it was actually like in the late 1800s or so, mid to late 1800s, where it was, I guess, born, so to speak. So everyone probably heard of Freud he was obviously around then as well. Yep. Um, so him and Carl Jung were the two founding fathers of psychoanalysis back then. So the first half of the 20th century was really those guys, you know, doing therapy the way that they used to. Therapist was more passive, you know, like the patients laying on the couch and they're interpreting dreams and they're writing on their notebook and a lot of, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they actually used, um, I believe cocaine at some point too, giving patients cocaine. So then people then. really were addicted to therapy. I guess to some degree. Why, and why don't I hear about, I, I, I remember hearing about, you know, I took psychology in high school right? because I had to, uh -huh. and I think I, did I taken, I must've taken it in, in college. I forget though, but, uh, I remember obviously Freud, you know, everybody knows Freud, Yeah. but young was Carl Young. Young. Mm -hmm. Not so is he kind of like the Andrew Ridgely of uh psychoanalysis? Who's that? Who, who, <laughs> who well, there's this band called Wham. Oh, and, oh, and yeah, okay. and see exact and, and exactly because you don't know, see that was guy. that was perfect because you kind of mouthed me. I don't know who that is. <laughs> exactly. But we know George Michael. So like why why doesn't he get the same, you know, accolades or or you know it's just I mean, weird. he does to some degree, you know. But but it's Freud. Is it because Freud is like famous for uh, so many other things too? I guess so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm just curious because it's like, you know, because that's a, kind of a big deal and it's like, you know, young. Oh, okay. And him too. All right. So, so go okay. ahead. So the second half of the uh, 20th century was when things started to shift a little bit. And actually, like I mentioned, in 1960 was when Aaron Beck pioneered cognitive behavioral therapy, and he introduced the idea of automatic thoughts and how thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all connected. There was a lot more research that occurred back then, experimental psychology, developmental psychology too, with uh, stages of development, particularly for children. 
So present day, um, a lot is focused on the third wave of psychology. So that's incorporating acceptance, commitment therapy, mindfulness, meditation, and kind of integrating all of it together. Okay. So I just remember back in its infancy, you know, it was just learning how to walk. Wasn't it? It was mostly just a way for in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. you know, men to just use for their their wives, maybe their mothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was predominantly women, white women, wealthy women, especially in New York. Psychoanalysis was a few times a week, actually, like you mentioned before, usually like two to three times a week of intense psychoanalysis. And women were, were the predominant patient, and they also were diagnosed, I guess, so to speak, at that point as neurotic or hysterical. And this is something that, again, you know, it's different households, whatever, but is it something that maybe they were told they need from their husbands? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because I just remember, you know, I'm very pop culture centric, obviously, Uh for my next reference here. But I just remember in Mad Men, Dom Draper had his wife go to a therapist and then they had conversations and he and the therapist had conversations. (laughs) There was no HIPAA back then. Yeah, exactly. And like, like, so what did she talk about today? What is she bothered about? She she won't talk to me and, and, uh, you know. Right, right. So, okay. So, obviously, with stories like that, because, and again, I know it's only a TV show, ladies and gentlemen, but it also did happen quite often, more often than it should have, obviously. But obviously, it had a bad rap back then. But do people don't know necessarily the history of it and how it has come a long way, but do people still look at it, do you think, in a negative way? Sometimes people still do. You know, there's still resistance. It's not as stigmatized as it used to be, Um, used to be for crazy people and it was hush hush no one really talked about their problems and right. you go to a shrink and you know it's just a waste of money it's like a pseudoscience it wasn't real definitely is better nowadays i mean we have a ton of people calling men and women included wait list all the time especially during the pandemic now so it's definitely um less stigmatized than it used to be have you noticed that the pandemic has caused a lot of your patients to focus on that? Like how, how has the pandemic mm-hmm. changed your practice or your sessions? You know, again, tell me what you can on some sure. level, um, you know. Well, we were really busy anyway, um, hence the fact why I have three offices, just to, you know, be able to serve different geographical locations. But an increase in anxiety and depression, for sure. People that have already had anxiety disorders um, obviously have more anxiety with the pandemic. A decrease in socialization. People are just stuck at home. There's an increase in depression, for sure, especially with the kids, you know, being out of school and just limited with academics. And um, the one positive of all of it is that we've been able to offer teletherapy, telehealth to people in the last almost last year and insurance has been covering it where in the past they never would cover it it would would only be just for in-office sessions so that has been great for the practice have any of your patients you know it's march 7th right now it's going to be a year pretty soon but have any of your patients because i mean just quickly you know and how I've looked at it is it really was an eye opener for me in some ways where I'm just looking at my life. You know, I turned 50 during it and I just thought to myself, you know, like there are a lot of things I always wanted to try. And, um, one of them was a podcast, but, um, you know, but seriously, it, it just makes me look at life in a different way. It's like, you know, now you can't do anything before. What was your excuse? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would imagine some people made some nice findings like I did maybe. And also, are they hopeful? Because we hear, you know, and again, whatever you think it's smart thing or, or not a smart thing, but, uh, you know, Texas is lowering its restrictions and, and other states are following. And I just, I mean, I know it's, I just don't believe, and I always get in trouble of hoping sometimes that I'm right as opposed to I am right, but I don't see it getting any worse. So are they hopeful now? People definitely have a lot more hope, um, especially after, you know, the winter, you know, and now with the vaccines, Mm -hmm. people are feeling more hopeful and getting getting back out there. So absolutely. And maybe more people will engage in therapy um, because of the pandemic, definitely having some PTSD probably from enduring it. Um, So, yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot of hope. Good. So would you say that the majority of your patients are more men or women? 
definitely more women. Uh, men are calling, especially in the past week, but it's it's predominantly women who enter into therapy. Okay. And, yeah. But you have seen an increase lately uh, of men? Definitely couples uh, calling, oh, okay. especially since the pandemic, like we talked about changes with the pandemic. And yeah, men have been calling the last few weeks for sure. So what do you think the stereotype is for men for therapy as, as a PhD? I mean, I know what I think and maybe what some of my friends might think, but I want to know what you think and what you've seen. As far as stereotypes of men going to therapy? Right. Like when yeah. they, you know, what, even the ones who do go, yeah. are they open? Are they, you know, are some guarded? Are. Some are. Some are secretive about it. Um, there's a lot of distorted beliefs that come into play from their family or their culture that it means that they're weak or they're not macho to go to therapy. More men would prefer to speak to a female therapist than a male therapist. Why so, do you think that is? I don't know. I guess they're just more comfortable with women. Maybe women tend to be more compassionate, easier to talk to. Maybe it's they're embarrassed to talk to a man. <laughs> I'm men, not sure. Men, men might be more judgmental. And men might be more judgmental. They might be more cut to the... And some people oh, no, are no, more trust, Oh, no, trust me. I, I've known many women who've been judgmental as well. Sure. I'm just saying... Oh, absolutely. Uh, they're out there too. So we can't generalize, Anthony. No, no, never. <laughs> that would no, be nobody in this country generalizes anything. <laughs> never, never. It's a cognitive distortion, right? Right. So, all right. Most of them are women. Do you see children? I do. Yeah. I specialize with children and um, adolescents and families. My training is in family therapy as well. And I'm a child psychologist. Oh, okay. And how are they, the pandemic, obviously for them. Children? Yeah. Is um, frustrating, maybe in some ways, I mean, it, you know, apples and oranges compared to adults, but still like with the school and everything. Yeah, absolutely. It must be tough. Kids are like I you know, I mentioned before, like kids are so affected uh, socially. They're just definitely more isolated. Horrible for social anxiety disorder. Uh, initially kids are like, yeah, I get to be behind a screen and I get to not really talk or or interact, but it, it just makes the fear worse, unfortunately, keeping them home and remote learning. Do you see any problems with those who suffer from social anxiety when COVID is finally gone or behind us. You mean, do you think people are going to still suffer from social anxiety disorder after COVID? Well, are there going to be new cases because of COVID? Could COVID you know, cause people who really didn't suffer from social anxiety to uh, now have a new issue because of this pandemic. I think that that is valid that there are people that probably had a mild case of social anxiety disorder prior to the pandemic and the the anxiety has exacerbated because of COVID. People using the pandemic as an excuse to avoid social situations. It's reinforced in the media to avoid groups clearly, even family members. So I think that absolutely there could be an increase in social anxiety disorder, in addition to health anxiety and generalized anxiety disorder because of the pandemic. All right. You know what? Let's, let's get away from COVID, as we all would like to. Let's stick with social anxiety disorders. Do you see an increase in social anxiety disorder, say, within the last 10 or 20 years? I would say yes, uh, especially with the youth, especially with children, adolescents, because everybody's behind their screens and socializing to them counts as texting, you know, using FaceTime. All of that was in place prior to the pandemic, which are great. But oftentimes kids use that as their socialization. I have plenty of patients who are, you know, millennials or adolescents that that's their only form of socialization is online gaming or just virtually having friends and not having the social skills organically to interact with their peers. All right. So what would a CBT expert or how would a CBT expert treat social anxiety disorder? I think, again, this is generally speaking, but what would be... Can't give the, away all my trade secrets. What would be <laughs> some of the building blocks? Uh, you know, don't give away all of them, but maybe you know one or two. Sure. So um, from a cognitive behavioral therapy model, we look at thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So how one perceives a situation, automatic thoughts pop into their mind, they have feelings attached to that, and they have behaviors. So the way that I would treat that 
would be to look at thinking patterns and per- potential thinking traps and distortions and thinking that people have in regard to social situations and then immediately have some behavioral homework for them to do. Like I mentioned before, the main behavioral response for any anxiety disorder, particularly social anxiety disorder, is that of avoidance. So we would come up with a homework plan of uh, exposure and response prevention for them to go to that party and test out that it's not so bad because they won't believe me that everything will be fine when they order food at Dunkin' Donuts or they go to a party. They have to actually experience that and see that it's not so bad and they can get through a tough situation. And you have to convince them, right, that they, it's going to be scary. Right. So I use a scale rating, convince them that it's, it might be a medium amount uncomfortable, but it's okay. I thread in uh, values. I thread in notions from acceptance commitment therapy that this is worth it for them in some way, whether it's because of family or friends or confidence. There has to be something meaningful behind convincing someone who gets so much positive reinforcement from avoidance that it's worth it to go order that coffee at Dunkin' Donuts because they get some benefit in some way. So it's a lot of uh, coaxing and convincing. All right. Well, you know, if it was easy, they, they wouldn't be seeing you, right? So, all right. Finally, finish up with the subject of today's show, which is the reputation of psychology. So getting back to that, Reputation of psychology, as you said, is a lot better than it was during its early days. But like anything, it could be better. So getting back to the core subject of this show, what can help the reputation of psychology improve? It's better than it was when it first began, but there's always room for improvement. So what can help it? improve and and make it better? I think the fact that we have accessibility to therapy services is much better, especially with telehealth. And I think just our generation, I think the millennial and the Gen X generation has different beliefs about psychology and going to therapy isn't so shameful. The older generations, particularly the baby boomers, would think that going to see a therapist is shameful or weak. So those thoughts and beliefs get passed down from generation to generation. So I think that's true, as well as the mindfulness movement and meditation that's incorporated into therapy as well. And uh, a lot of celebrities, a lot of renowned people practice that. So it's not seen as this weird phenomenon like it used to back in the day. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Thank you for joining us. If anybody has any questions about this session or ideas for a topic that we can talk about in our next session, where should people go, Dr. Rafa? They can reach us at info at Inner Balance Psychology Center. They can send an email about future topics or questions they may have about this episode or psychology in general. You can also look for us at our website, www.innerbalancepsychology.com. We have some information on there as far as our services, and there is a click to call the office as well as send an email to set up an appointment. Once again, Talk Therapy CBT has been brought to you by Inner Balance Psychology Center. Thank you for joining us in our first episode. We hope you enjoyed it. For Dr. Dawn Rafa, I'm Anthony Dana. And remember, stop it and give yourself a chance.